I wanted to uh, go over some comments that Jeff Lawton made a year ago on his YouTube channel. And so I want to read off some of the things that he said. And someone just asked him, you know, what kind of wood should I put in my Hugo culture? And so he was trying to discourage the practice entirely, except maybe if you live in the mountains of Austria. And said that you don't want to put a old, cold climate European system in the warm tropics. So did that mean that he was only discouraging it in the tropics? I wasn't sure. But then he also discouraged it for a Mediterranean climate and Pacific Northwest is actually very similar to Mediterranean with um, you know our wet winters and dry summers. He said that he sees average performing Hugo cultures at best, not amazing, but mostly he sees them getting built. He's not confident that they would work in the long run. He doesn't like the practice of burying carbon as it extracts nitrogen to rot the high carbon. When it's hot and dry, the pile would break down slowly while taking the nitrogen. In the Mediterranean summer, it would need extra water because the mound is well drained, which is the last thing you want to do. And I would, you know, I would agree, I guess if you're managing many, many acres, you don't want to have to water piles. He said if anything in the desert or otherwise a dry summer, you would want to grow in a pit filled with mulch. And if you're thinking about making a hugel swell, well, they will collapse eventually and they're awkward to walk around. And then he said he's only seen pumpkins and zucchinis grow on them. And so what? Because you can easily grow them on the a flat ground. But he did invite videos showing abundant Hugo cultures growing, high productivity on them. And so, you know, if we can watch how they progress over time, and if people see a bunch of evidence from individuals that they work, then maybe it's something that, you know, it could be recommended to a broader audience. You can plant annuals mixed in with perennials or just do one or the other. Was Jeff Lawton thinking you only put annuals in it? I don't know. You don't plant in neat rows. You can be willy-nilly about it. But you want to put starts in it, maybe from like four inch pots. You don't want to have to seed into it because it would be challenging to seed into that, especially if you want to mulch it immediately. So it's good for putting plant starts in it. It's good for putting bare root plants in it. Then you can mulch it right away and then prevent weeds getting on there. You can plant your plants close together to get a closed canopy as soon as possible and take out plants if and when there are too much of them and they're crowding each other out. Think about your directions. So on the north side of the mound, you can do cooler plants like lettuce and taller plants also on the north side because they won't be shading out anything on the south side you can do plants that need more sun like tomatoes if you do have logs on the outside of it you can think about growing shiitake on the logs to make it more productive but consider that you know i just did a video that says you want to keep the shiitake off the soil so you don't have competing fungi in there so maybe consider that a bit if you want extra production if you are going to put wood chips on there you can inoculate them with wine caps and have wine caps also growing on your mounds i got a very charming walk through a hugo culture at the end of the workshop it didn't just have like one trail on it it had like several trails over the mounds and it was perhaps the most charming walk i've ever had through a garden that it's going to be a bit of a challenge for me to kind of step back from it and be objective. They described getting dynamic production in year one in their bed. If you put a bunch of compost, magic compost especially, minerals, and then you put plants in it, it's going to grow. It's not like they were trying to just grow in uh, dirt. Your native soil that hasn't been peed on <laughs> long enough. Yes, it is a high intensity input and you need high yield to justify it. This is kind of like, I think a direct answer to Lawton, who I think was thinking um, all the labor isn't worth the you know production you get. But these guys are thinking about that. They're thinking, yeah, it's the Hugo culture is heavy labor in the beginning. So you need high yield to justify it. So they, it's not like they're ignoring that. 
and they think sep holzer is what crosses the line where it gets too much labor for the yield the way i'm describing it they think that the yield is worth the effort i mean it's not like they're the type of people that Lawton was describing, who were just like, oh, it's uh, it's permaculture, so I have to do a fuga culture. And just being mindless about it without really thinking, is it worth my time? So the fuga culture is not a sponge in the beginning. In addition, in the first year, the roots that you plant into it, they haven't grown far down enough so that even if it was a sponge, that it could even access it. So with those two things working together, you do have to irrigate it, apparently, but you have less need for irrigation once the plants are established, and of course, after the logs become a sponge. So in our climate, you may have to water four times a year in the early years before you get that sponge action. So starting in June or whenever the drought has started. Some people put sprinklers on top of the Hugo culture. So what are the benefits of a Hugo culture? First thing, you have an increase in surface area. You gotta think about the surface area you have when it's flat and the surface area that you have when it's bounded. If you have more surface area, you can put more plants in it. The advantage of going steeper would just be you would have more surface area, right? More surface area, more yield. The second thing is you can move up a zone. So if you're a uh, zone seven, then you can plant zone eight plants in your mound. In our climate, what would do better in a mound? That kind of mound would be like tomatoes, peppers, spilanthes, ashwagandha. So it extends the season for those plants. These plants that like warm soil, because obviously a raised bed is known for getting warmer. And if it's raised and it's heated via mounded organic material in, in the center of it, that's just all the better for these plants. The third benefit would be the wood provides nutrients over time. So you have uh, a f not just a free source of nutrients, but no work nutrients. So even though it's high input at first to create that pile, even if you did get free nutrients later, you don't have to add them later. So it minimizes the work that you have to do later. The fourth thing, carbon sequestration. I can do a whole video on that. And it's actually on my to-do list, so I'm not gonna I'm not going to talk about it too much right now. Next one, you slow down the movement of water. So you're slowing down the movement of water as well as catching and sinking it. And you are preventing erosion by preventing runoff. You can use your mounds to direct the water where you want it. And that includes holding the water in your mound as a sponge for plants to access with less work on your part, at least eventually. If you make a tall pile, then your cuga culture can also act as a windshield. It can also act as a privacy hedge. And when you plant on it, it'll be a, a green food fence. Another benefit is you're helping organisms to live there. We're missing ecological functions in our yards mostly. We tend not to have many snags. So this mound is providing ecological support as well as food production. If you put rocks on the bottom of it, those rocks can house snakes and lizards, and they could eat any rodents that do happen to tunnel in the mound. Also, I like rocks because mushrooms and worms, I think, extract minerals from the rocks over time, and so could make that available for the plants. And it's well draining, in the case that you need well draining. <laughs> In Eastern Washington, where you have less rain and more desert condition, the Hugo culture speeds up decomposition. Because if you were to leave woody debris flat on the ground, it's gonna dry up, it's not gonna decompose. So putting it in a mound will speed up decomposition in that sort of climate. So in the tropics, where decomposition is actually fast, the Hugo culture will slow it down because biomass piled really high won't decompose as fast as stuff lying on the ground and making contact with the ground. So in my mind, if that's true, and if you do want to slow decomposition down in the tropics, I would say don't add manure, right? Because don't we learn that in the bigger a compost mound is, the hotter it gets, and then the hotter it gets, the faster it decomposes. So I don't, I'm not sure what he means by that, except maybe if you don't add manure, it might slow it down.
You might want to put it in your zone one or zone two, maybe further away if you are getting other benefits from it, like a windshield, privacy hedge. But otherwise you want to keep it closer because you might have to irrigate it and weed it. As long as you manage it, it does well. Any other area you'll grow in, if you don't manage it, it's going to get weedy. So it doesn't magically not succumb to the same weed pressures as any other growing area. The weeding pressures should decrease over the years. And just like on the flat ground, if you want fewer weeds, put mulch on top in between your plants. That's the only management strategy. It doesn't need any more minerals or soil after the setup. Your foot could fall through in the case that you do have a pathway on it. And so you might have to fill that in later if you do get a, a collapse in there. So I would say that would be part of a maintenance plan. In the desert, you can put hugoculture in trenches. So you can put your mound below the soil level. Maybe part of it would stick above it and you wanna keep it from drying winds. And so I think this sounds like what Lawton was saying. He's saying you grow in a pit with mulch, except there's still the difference in that one of them has buried carbon and the other one doesn't. If you notice plants yellowing because of low nitrogen, then you can put liquid fish and kelp in water and then you can spot add it to the plants. And that kind of sounds like one of my JLFs. If you have like a high nitrogen input, whether you're buying fish or kelp from the store or you're making your own liquid fertilizer, then you can add it directly onto the yellow plants. Sometimes it'll work in the first application. Like he said, sometimes it's had to do three applications, but never more than that. What's the life cycle like? Do you keep adding stuff to it and rebuilding it? Is that your permanent hugoculture spot forever? And what they said was, no, you let it subside, and then when it's done, then you'll put a hugoculture someplace else. So you let them mature, and then you move on to another site. You don't keep adding or rebuilding it in the same spot. And if you plant trees on top, which I found amazing, <laughs> then the trees will just subside with the pile. And same thing with shrubs. You can be creative with your mound. So what I've seen on a lot of YouTube channels is people putting hugocultures in raised beds. You'll see people dig out soil, throw wood in there, and then bury it with soil. And they still call it hugoculture, but it's in a raised bed. When it's built that way though, you're not getting that surface area advantage, right? They might think it's more tidy that way. I think it's much more beautiful when it's a mound. When I think of the creative things that you can do with a hugoculture, it kind of reminds me of a raised terra preta but maybe only if you put biochar in it because that's one of the things they say made that such rich soil is the biochar. But I don't wanna get in a big discussion about how that is put together. But just to say that I'm madly in love with the idea of stacking our organic waste. If we have it, you don't have to go out of your way. Maybe in a desert, you don't have that, sure. But if you got humans, you got waste and if you're greening or foresting that desert, eventually you are going to have that woody material. If it's like a raised terra preta, let's do it. We have wood. What are we going to do with it? What are our priorities? Number one, wood is mostly prized for structures like our houses, art, furniture. Second, firewood for energy. Then you have your gardening inputs. Can I make wood chips out of this? Can I make biochar with it? And then hugoculture would just be one of those gardening things you can do with it. And that's benefiting us mostly because we eat from the garden, but it's also benefiting nature. The microorganisms have a place to live. Little critters have a place to live. If you have wood chips on the ground, you can spend all day watching the birds dig through your wood chips and then like finding little worms. They could just move their head once and then they find something. The least priority are things that are more nature than us which is making like wildlife structures on your property for like bobcats, bears, you know, making little shaping the debris into like caves, leaving it as snags, that sort of thing. And so I would say those are things that are more nature than us. When nature benefits, we benefit. You might get it, I don't have to explain it. So when you see burn piles as you're driving, that wood should be used for one of those things that I described. So one of my observations was you're gonna to have to bring in soil if you really want this to work in year one. And definitely, if you're building a, a mound on a terrace like I am, you have to bring in soil because you just don't have any that you can put on top of it. As much as I love that huge mound, they had to bring in a lot of soil for that. 
I would keep it smaller and I try to maximize the free inputs or organic inputs in the middle of it. But if I have to add to it, I don't have enough soil from the ground to put on top. If I can just make enough of my own compost so that the mixture of the compost and the native soil would be enough, so maybe I don't have to bring in anything. So I think once you have to bring in something, you really have to think of, okay, what's the end result? And I wanna, I'm gonna talk about that. What's, what's the end result if you're bringing in all this foreign soil. Now the, th the part about the irrigating, I agree with Lawton, you know, I, when I learned about cuticle culture, I thought the whole point of it was that you don't have to water it. And so when I hear that you have to water it, I think it depends. How long do they last? Even if you have to irrigate at first, how many years of not having to irrigate do you get after that? Does that, how many years does that buy you when it finally does become a sponge? So that I didn't get from the workshop because they didn't have a mound that was more than four years old. I don't think that they showed us. But again, you can minimize that by just starting your mound with rotted wood. And for me as a dry farmer, I would probably try to make it work. Maybe I would maybe sacrifice year one and year two production. And I would just let it sit and collect water for the first few years. And you know, why do I need to plant into it right away? You know, like, especially if you have a side job, you don't need money in year one you know, you're just doing it for your home use. I would rather let it just sit there and saturate rather than install any kind of irrigation. Because to me, that just defeats the purpose. 